Welcome everyone to uh, this broadcast of Ascend TV, Life on the Autism Spectrum. I'm Keith Halperin. And I'm Will Burnick. And today our topic is autism and loneliness. And our guest is Michelle Garcia Winner, SLP, founder and CEO of Social Thinking. But before we get into our conversation with her, Will, what's your shirt today? I'm, I'm, I'm glad you asked. Today's shirt is my USF Don shirt. I'm wearing it to, to promote USF w one more time. They're, both their baseball season and their spring semester are ending this month. They, they, had, a, they had a great season. This, the fans will continue to support them even after their season ends. Indeed. Thank you. Could you stand up briefly and show our viewers uh, the shirt itself? Tell us about your background in, in, the, in the autism community. Well... In the 1980s, I, I'm from San Francisco, born and raised, and then went to UC Santa Barbara for my undergraduate. And then I went to Indiana University for my graduate degree as a speech language pathologist. And when I arrived in Indiana, I learned about an autism center that I just was for whatever reason, interested in autism. Didn't know a whole lot about it. So I started in volunteering in the Indiana Resource Center for Autism. And there I worked with individuals who today would be considered ASD level one with learning challenges and <clears throat> the most significant, um, the most complicated form of autism, I would say in many ways. And I was absolutely fascinated by it. But when I went to grad school in the 80s, the speech and language department was not at all interested in autism. They didn't teach about it. They didn't know about it. And so I got my master's degree and um, I ended up moving back to California and I started working at a, um, I did a number of jobs where I worked in what they call subacute settings in hospitals. These are once you're dismissed, uh, removed, checked out of a hospital, if you still need a lot of treatment, you go to what's called a subacute. And there I worked with a lot of people with head injuries um, and stroke and learned a lot about the brain and different parts of the brain and how to help address a whole variety of challenges uh, that people have acquired. And then my children, uh, in this process, I was also getting married and having children. And now my children were going to school and I wanted to be on the school schedule. So I started working at a high school district. And in, that, uh, in the district, who's on the caseload of a high school speech pathologist, but a lot of uh, many students on the autism spectrum. At the time, it wasn't called the autism spectrum. It was, there were things like autism and Asperger syndrome and PDD-NOS, which I found really helpful, those different uh, categories, more so than I find us calling it the autism spectrum helpful. Um, and anyhow, I started helping. And what I found was that my students who had awareness of their autism or like disabilities because autism overlaps a lot with ADHD and speech and language challenges. Um, those who had awareness were often very angry that they um, were dealing with some of these issues and were mad that they even had to come see me when I first started working with them. And so I listened to a lot of their concerns and I realized that I needed to teach more than what do you do like, what are the skills you're supposed to do? Um, it's not about memorizing skills. It was about understanding how the social world works. And so I went on a journey with my students to try to figure out how does the social world work? And that's at the center of what social thinking is, is that we always teach what's happening, why are things happening? Uh, what do people expect from each other? What do my students expect from others? It's not just neurotypical people expect, you know, everyone else to do things. People on the autism spectrum also have expectations for each other. And so in that journey, I began to evolve what's called uh, social thinking. And it's actually the formal name of it is Think Social Publishing, Inc. Uh, as I started uh, creating this, many people were saying, well, where's your book? Um, and then I found it was helpful to write things out in, in visual ways for my students. And so, um, but the reality is if I was to name the company again today, I would just call it Social Thinking um, Incorporated. So that's kind of the base. I'm to this day really, really fascinated um, and still learning while I've worked with uh, 
our, our work starts with individuals who are four years old and older. And the reason that we start at four is we, that's the age where you start to have awareness what we're expected to do around other people and what people expect from us. And so uh, we have different materials or information for kids of different ages all the way up through adults. And today I only work with what I describe as mature adults, which are uh, individuals 30 years old and older, my oldest clients in his mid seventies. Um, and I find the work to this day still fascinating after all these years, and I'm still learning. What, Michelle, what is social thinking? Um, so social thinking is exploring the process in which we attend to others, what their intentions are, um, based on what they're doing or saying or what they're not doing or not saying with awareness for many of us that others are also trying to interpret our actions or lack of action, what we're doing or not doing, what we're saying or not saying. And in that process, we try to make sense of each other Um what we're trying to convey, or if we want to participate, or if we don't want to participate. And so in that process, we start to make sense of each other's social minds. And it's interesting because um, as we relate to each other socially, um, it's not just about a social interaction. It's making sense of what each other is meaning um, and us trying to make meaning of others in context, what based on what's going on around us. Um, our social thinking is not just for social interaction. It's not like when people hear the word social, they often think of party. Um, it's really about making sense of things. And if you cannot make sense of people and interpret their actions and reactions and intentions or imagine, what it is they want, then reading comprehension of literature is not because literature is books and books and books written about social relationships and all relationships involve awareness or some level of thinking about other people, whether it's just to make sure we don't collide with someone um, or whether we wanna make a good impression or whether we want someone to know we're angry, that's all okay. We just, um, this awareness that we are all aware of each other to some extent is what social thinking is about. All right, well, why don't I'm gonna share my screen and I'm gonna show you some PowerPoint slides when I'm talking to an audience to try to explain kind of what's at the heart of social thinking not social thinking my company, but at the heart of how you and I process or think about each other, whether we're watching somebody um, from afar or whether we're interacting with that person. So I'm gonna show you, I think you guys can see this. This is called the social thinking competency model. And I'm gonna click it to full screen here. All right, you guys see that? Yes. So what you're looking at is what we call our social thinking um, competency model. And um, it involves what we call social cognition. So in our minds, we have different types of cognitions. Many of you are familiar with there's kind of a, a math based ability. Those who are great at math versus those who really struggle in math. There's language based abilities. There's science based abilities. And in the social world, there's what are social-based abilities. And so um, some years ago, myself and my team, which is Dr. Pam Crook and Stephanie Madrigal, we started thinking about how do we break down this information to help people build up their competencies? What is it we actually have to teach? And what we knew for sure was teaching someone a behavior and getting them to memorize a behavior was not helpful. So the question is why? And so what you're seeing here is the first part, when you think about how we get to what you see over here, our social cognitive self-regulation, or just think about self-regulation of ourself um, and others, you, it starts with social attention. And social attention is awareness of what's happening around us or what's happening in the scene we're seeing. So like if you're watching a screen, a movie on a screen, or you're watching people on a screen, 
your attention is to what's happening with the people in the situation that they are. And then as you attend, and let me just mention that social attention is really different from science attention. Social attention requires you to really pay attention to what's happening, the context, the situation, who are the people? What do we know about their roles? Is it a teacher and children in a classroom? Does this look like a parent-child interaction? Are these two friends? Um, so this is all part of like, we're attending to information in order to interpret it. So the attention is just being able to make note of what is the situation? Who are the people? And then we're interpreting what's happening with those people and trying to make sense of what they're doing, listening listening to what they're doing and watching because a huge part of the social world or the social interaction has to do with taking notice of, you know, observing people and observing the situation. And then um, when we do that, let's see, it's not letting me go to my next slide, unfortunately. So you see that big gap there in the attend interpret? This is weird that it's not letting me do this. All right, you would see in that big gap where it says social interpretation, you'd see a little head that says self, and then another head pops up that says others. And then the two heads come together and it's called self others. In the social world, we're always trying to make sense of oneself and others. And others can be a whole bunch of people. Like I mentioned, a classroom, a work environment, uh, participating, you know, uh, being in a grocery store where there's a lot of people. And so as we account for who's around and what we think their roles are, we then start trying to make sense of that what happening part, and that's the problem solving. So it's not problem solving like, oh my gosh, there's a huge problem. It's really about making sense of what's happening with, as we attend and interpret uh what people are doing, what's happening in that situation, that leads to um, possibly social responses. Might lead, a social response might be what we say, what um, how we make sense of what someone else is saying. A social response may be choosing not to do anything at all as the best response we take. And so you see this arrow goes over to social cognitive self-regulation. And if I could get my slides working, around this circle of social responses, it would say social evaluation and self-evaluation. How are we evaluating how we're doing? How are we making sense of what other people are doing? And then it leads right back to attend, interpret, problem solve for more responses. Um, for example, just think about being with other people and you're talking to them, but you realize you need to leave for some reason. How is it that you leave? Do you just simply turn around and walk away and not say anything at all? If so, that would be, people would be a little bit confused because usually when we're talking to somebody else and we need to leave, we talk to them about, oh, I've got a meeting or my class is next or I've got something going on or we just make a nice greeting like, well, it was nice to talk to you while we start to move our body back and turn to walk away. So, this whole process is developmental. What we expect from four-year-olds, which is the age that we begin, uh, we, we encourage people not to use social thinking um, younger than four, because four is when children have quite a bit of language and awareness that they're part of a group and that the group has rules. And uh, then every stage of our life, all the way along, our expectations for each other, uh, the way we act um, is developmental. So what we might expect from how 20 year olds respond and relate to each other is quite different from how we might expect 50 year olds to respond and relate to each other. So um, that's kind of the basis of what social thinking is. Thank you, Michelle and Matt. Michelle, I understand uh, your more recent work has involved uh, autism and loneliness. Can you tell our viewers about that? The work actually, when, when I talked about loneliness, it's not uh, addressed specifically to the autism spectrum. It was uh, more and more what we're finding, even with the use of our work, social thinking, that it's being adopted into mainstream classes and that a variety of people are using the strategies that we've created 
And so, um, you know, my clients, as I work, continue to work with folks on the autism spectrum or with related disabilities, um, my work is not exclusively for those on the spectrum. Loneliness is just a big part of people's lives. And I was, you know, reading quite a bit in the literature about loneliness is so prominent. And I became really interested in thinking that maybe this would be a good topic to address in one of our live stream events that we do through my company for the public. Um, some of our conferences, they always used to be face to face. And then after the pandemic, uh, where we could only broadcast information uh, through a video studio, through our video studio at our company, um, started realizing that loneliness is really a thing. And it's um, certainly a really important concept to address for folks on the spectrum, but surprisingly, it's a really important concept to address for the world, that it was remar it's remarkable how many people are lonely in today's society. And so that was the impetus of uh, creating this loneliness talk is to get us talking more about it and thinking about ways in which, you know, how do we connect? Uh, what are some of the mechanisms we use? Can you describe some of the, you know, overall views or some of the mechanisms and how particularly they might uh, relate to our autistic community? I, the autism, the community of autism have been, if, if you're willing to learn, they are incredible teachers right? Because they help you to learn so much about um, not only people, but the social brain, the social social cognition. Um, how does it work? How do we make sense of something so complicated? And so in this journey, one of the big things that I've done through my company is created visual tools that breaks down information with the hope of building up competencies that can be available um, for anyone who wants to access them, and certainly for the autism community. And one of those is the friendship pyramid that I started to create because I, as I worked with my students and I like working with a lot of older students, uh, high schoolers, because they can really talk to you much more about what they understand and don't understand. And in that journey, it helped me to create information to help them understand a concept more. So one of those concepts that one of my, my teenagers started talking about is friendship. Like, what is it? You know, not, not the idea that you have a friend, but is there just one type of friendship? You know, how do you even enter into a friendship? And so that led me to create what I describe as uh, the friendship pyramid. So I can show that to you if my computer is going to work today. Let me see if I can share screen. Okay, so the friendship pyramid has six levels to it. And I'm just going to tell you the these titles are the first one is just friendly greetings. Second one is acquaintance based relationships. The third is situational friendships. The fourth are what we call kind of our classic friends. The fifth is bonded friend and the sixth is close friend. And now I'm going to take a moment to just explain what each of these levels are. So friendly greetings is pretty obvious. It's just acknowledging someone as as you walk by them. And we have some uh, interesting rules about this, that if you greet every time you see someone across a day, so imagine working at a school and people are constantly walking back and forth uh, based on bell schedules about what time it is during the day. So you may be seeing like one of the people that you know over and over and over again as you walk by them in the day, do you say hi to them every time you see them? And the answer is no, that you greet them the first time with kind of your full body greeting where you might wave your hand, you might look at them uh, towards towards their face, not in the eyes. Doesn't I, I'm not one who's like, you must give eye contact. I actually think that we don't give eye contact um, all the time, but we look towards that person. We may... Uh, put our hand up and say hi while our face is looking friendly as we look towards them. So that's a friendly greeting. Um, and all, you know, relationships usually start with a friendly greeting, unless you make a relationship in a classroom where you're assigned to a group because you have to work on a project, then you don't start with a friendly greeting. But if you're talking to a person that you're doing a project with, 
and uh, you want to have that person perceive you in a positive light, when you pass that person at school, you might start giving them a greeting. So you don't greet every single person you, you meet. You greet people who have um, made a positive um, impression on you or and you want to make a positive impression on them uh, as you pass by them. So an acquaintance is the next level. And that's a person you talk to because you happen to be near them. So if you think about being a student, students stand in a lot of lines for different reasons. And so you start talking to the person who's just standing in the line to just give you something to do. But in starting to talk to someone and showing interest in them, that actually usually makes a good impression. Not always, there's always little tricky parts to this. Um, and so that's an acquaintance. An acquaintance is not considered, you know, a person who's really a friend. They're just someone who happened to be there. So you happen to talk to them. Some of your workmates, if you have a job, are more of acquaintances. They happen to be at the company. So you happen to be near them. So you happen to talk to them about something, but you don't hang out with them necessarily or, or choose to spend any more time with them. Level three on the friendship pyramid is situational friend. And that's a person that you meet in a specific place like school or work or sports. And then you make plans to be with them. So, hey, you wanna have lunch together or you know, uh, what are you doing after school today? For this one, it's that because you happen to be in the same place all the time, uh, you then start to relate to that person a little bit more by making some kind of plan with them. Uh, but usually that plan, always that plan happens in the place in which you met them. It doesn't extend to places outside of where you met them. That's higher on the friendship pyramid. Level four on the friendship pyramid are people who make plans to spend extra time with each other away from the place in which you met them. So if at school you're do, working on a <clears throat> school project with a kid and you think they're pretty cool, so now you're saying hi to them and you're meeting up to work on that project and then you're actually hanging out a little bit after that project, that would be level three. But now you say to that kid, hey, um, you want to come over, you know, come to my house, you want to go to a movie together, do you want to go have, you know, meet at a coffee shop? when you're leaving the place in which you met to extend the relationship outside of that uh, level three situation, now that's level four. And we're calling that friends um, because you're actually making the extra effort. And if you're familiar with the term executive functioning, you've got a goal, you've got some um, plans to meet that goal, and then you get yourself to try to do the actions to be able to follow through on all of that that would be level four. Level five are bonded friends. And if you guys think back to um, high school, you'll think about kids who hung out in cliques, groups. And uh, one of the interesting things about bonded friends are kids may be hanging out with each other. There may be a group of four or six kids hanging out with each other in high school, but it doesn't mean they all like each other. But they're there to kind of, you know, they hang out, they have fun together. They may support each other, but because, you know, you're a friend of a friend and that friend hangs out with these other kids, now all of a sudden you're part of this bonded friend group. And so um, you may not really like a person a lot in that group, but you like being part of that group. And so you just tolerate the fact that one of the kids kinds of bugs, bugs you. Um, and then a level six friend are... We have very few of these in our life at any one time. Usually we may have just one really close friend. We may have two or three, but we rarely have more than four because the brain just can't handle that much, that many people as being really close in our lives. Um, so that's kind of what the friendship pyramid is about. And this is what I developed when I was working with uh, this group of students on the autism spectrum, and they were like, how do we figure out what friendship is? So I started thinking about it. I broke it down into these levels. And then I found a researcher had written about friendship and pretty much defined these same type of levels that I had identified. And so then it gives kids choices. You know, who do you want to be with? What kind of friend are they? How are you appearing to them if they're saying, hey, you want to come over and you're always turning them down? What messages are you sending versus how do you make opportunity to be with people um, 
who you know you find are that that you like uh, to some level, and you're getting uh, cues from them that they also like being with you. On the sides of the friendship pyramid, you'll see from level three to five, we call it on again, off again. I think uh, in many of people's lives, they may have a friend that they're really spending a lot of time with for a period of time in a group, and then they stop seeing that friend. And then a couple years later, that friend uh, comes back into their life again. And so not all friendships share the same level of intensity. And then at the top of the friendship pyramid, where it's level six, you may just have one really close friend. And that's great. I remember when I developed this with my teenage group, one of the boys said, I, I just have this one really close friend. Is that OK? And I'm like, of course, anything's OK. But the more I learned about this guy, I found he actually had no one else. There was no level one, two, three, four, or five on his in his life. He just had this one kid. And that can become a problem because it puts a lot of pressure on that one kid to pretty much provide everything socially for, for this client. And so he started exploring how he could greet other people. How do you even notice that there's people around you who may be friendly and willing to you know, hang out with you. And so that's the journey of the friendship pyramid. Michelle, that was excellent. Um, one thing though, listening, uh, Keith, maybe we can get into Michelle, the other side, which is your advice to our community in terms of how to reach out and make more friendships or how to overcome loneliness. Um, okay. And then I had a kid who said to me, a teenager said, um, but I don't like people. And so that led me to create the pyramid of dislike. Thank you very much, Michelle. This was highly informative. Um, I'd like to now lead in what, what type of advice that you have uh, for our community as far as dealing with loneliness and, and sort of as a sidebar of that. How do you deal with the social anxiety portion of loneliness and how that feeds into uh isolation and so on. General advice to our community about how some ways of how best to overcome loneliness. And secondly, if people are suffering from social anxiety, which is contributing to uh, their inability to reach out, how do you deal with that? Or how do you recommend that we deal with that? So in terms of trying to overcome loneliness, um, the first thing we have to do is observe. And we have to spend a lot of time observing people, uh, those who are considered neurotypical, if there is such a thing as neurotypical as we all have something going on. Um, one of the things that I noticed is that my students were not great observers. They, they just moved through the space without taking notice of the people. They often took notice of things, of interesting things that were going on, but not the people. And so, all social begins with observation, making sense of people. Who do I want to be with? Uh, what are other people doing? Who do I think wants to be with me? And I think it's really important that we realize that we all have choices. Everyone, that's our uh, program uh, for this time. Until next time, I'm Keith Halperin. I'm Will Burnick. I'm Stacey Kennedy. I'm Jennifer Brooks. I'm Michelle garcia Winner. And we're Ascend TV, Life on the Autism Spectrum. Until next time, take care and be well.